Are you tired of struggling to connect with your target audience and unsure of how to communicate your message effectively? If so, you're in the right place, because in today's episode, we'll explore practical tips and proven methods to help you craft a clear and concise message that resonates with your audience and inspires them to take action. My name is Matt Giaro, and you are listening to Build Your Thing, the podcast where we help content creators find their unique creative voice, build their tribe of loyal fans, and monetize their work. And my guest today is Terry Dean. Terry went from delivering pizzas to creating a full-time income online in 1996. He was one of the first online marketers to demonstrate the power of email, generating 96,000 $250 from one email to his list in front of a live audience. And in the past 27 years, he has personally helped thousands of clients in hundreds of different markets create and sell online courses, improve their website conversions, and earn an excellent income even from small email lists. So whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or just starting out, you'll discover valuable insights and actionable steps to help you clarify your message and grow your business. So get ready for an online marketing masterclass with Mr. Terry Dean. All right, Terry, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here, Matt. And I'm super happy to have you here because like, as I mentioned before, you're kind of an internet dinosaur. So for those who don't know you, like, could you please introduce yourself quickly? Well, I don't know if the dinosaur is the right word, although I started a long time ago, back in 1996. So, I mean, that's that's ancient days. At least the computer I started on was a dinosaur. It was a Pentium 75 way back when. And I got my start after basically failing at a lot of business opportunities. I heard that some people were online. This was like the very early days of the internet. And I bought my first PC, I got online, and I was able to create a full-time income pretty quickly because I tapped into one of the core principles that's worked for me and worked for a lot of others, which was building an email list and sending out viable, valuable content to your audience regularly to build relationship. And that was really my start that launched me into the internet and really has taken me to where I am today. Wow, that's fascinating. And Before digging deeper into today's topic about clarifying your message, I would really like to get your take on how did you see the internet marketing slash coaching industry evolve within the last three decades? Well, that's a pretty big question. And here's something that I've mentioned recently and I find fascinating myself. And that is when I first started online, I told you that I started building my email list. And obviously I tested a lot of different strategies for growing my email list. For example, I was running banner ads on a website. And the funny thing is banner ads went out of style for a long time, but then they came back in style. Then they went out of style. And then now people are running a type of banner ads through such as the Google Display Network and other types of networks. So it's almost like it came back. Another way that I built my list in the beginning was I actually participated in CompuServe message boards. And anybody who's on the younger set might not even know what a CompuServe is. They were back there at the same time as AOL was big and was sending out all those free disks. But CompuServe had all these message boards and I would go and participate on message boards, answer people's questions, create relationships, and then promote additional content that you could go over and get by joining my email list. And do you realize that's the exact same strategy that many of my clients use today? It's just social media or Facebook groups or different types of social media that we use that you go out and you reach out, you produce content, you use personality and stories to draw people onto your list. So it's almost like it came first circle. I started with CompuServe message boards and today we do a lot of list building through social media. So it's like the same things come back into place. And it's almost like the same principles come back into place. And I'm really thankful. One of the things that I did early on is I focused, well, there's several things, but I focused really heavily on learning how to do persuasion online, to persuade people to purchase, for example. And I also learned a lot about really providing valuable content 
that had personality and style to it because it integrates in with this. And that's how you build an audience. And those things have stayed true no matter what has happened throughout the internet. And I mean, I've been here since Google grew up. Google wasn't there when I started. We had other search engines. Google eventually came up and they now dominate the search market. I've been here since all the social media sites have grown. But as I said, even when I first started, I was still using that early, you know, crappy version of social media to grow my list even way back then. So I've seen things change, but no matter how much it changes, it's it's surprising to many people that it still stays the same. It's just, we find new ways to adapt and grow. And like at the moment we're doing this interview, AI and the different types of AI services that can produce content and help you produce content are big right now. That doesn't really change a whole lot either. I mean, throughout the years, I mean, that's a big boost. That's a big boost in productivity for us, but it's still not going to change the fact that you have to add personality and style and stories into whatever content that you're producing. And the people who do good with the trends today are going to be the same people who did well previously as because it's the same type of thing that we have to do because it's the same type of connection that we're making with people. So the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. You just need to make sure that you know what's going on and you're able to tap into the trends and continue to connect with people. It all goes back to the principles, right? And this reminds me of a, of a quote, I guess it was in Claude Hopkins' Scientific Advertising or My Life in Advertising, where he just mentioned that you'll better off learning the basics of human psychology because they don't change. And especially in a fast-changing environment like today, we see changes all the time in algorithms, in ad rules, etc., right? So instead of having to relearn everything from scratch, focus on the principles because principles are durable and principles last. I think that you touched a very important point. Like what I see even when I work with clients is that many, many people actually have an issue with um, really identifying the principles and the things that they have to work on because there is so much noise out there today that you really, you know, you don't know how to identify the signal from the noise. So I would really love to hear like your take on that. Well, let's break it down and make it really simple. For somebody to have a successful online business, and I specifically deal with small businesses and home-based businesses. I don't deal with any large corporations. And even in my consulting, although I consult at times with clients who are seven, eight, up into the eight figures, I don't consult with any businesses where there's not an entrepreneur who makes the decisions. Okay, so you can just think that with my clients, it's all the way from the beginner up to eight-figure businesses, but they always have an entrepreneur in charge, no committees that I have to speak to. And when I'm dealing with these types of businesses, you really got to get back to what are the basics in my business. And there's only just a few basics that you need to concentrate on. The first one is your audience, knowing who your audience is, who you're speaking to, and building a relationship with them. Okay. Coming up with that, you want to build a list. And of course, I'm always going to emphasize the importance of an email list because social media and all these other tools for connection are great. And they're great for bringing people in, but the sales for myself and the majority of my clients, they come through email and it's that connection. So email, so you're going to have some type of consistent email that you send out. You need to have offers to make to the audience. Obviously you need good offers that can deliver results to your clients and you need to understand the persuasion methods to actually sell those offers. And so I just gave you four major points that are the basics. And I mean, we could dive into any of those and talk more about any of those, but those are the basics to your business. And it doesn't matter what type of market you're in, because I'm going to mention this. I've been here a long time online, but I actually think one of the biggest benefits to me is I have a lot of insights because I help clients in a lot of different markets. You'll hear some people talk about marketing. They only have experience in their own market or with other business-related markets. I have clients in consumer fields and business fields. For example, at this moment, I have a client who sells to CPAs, another one that sells to chiropractors. I also have clients who sell products about tennis, about learning Spanish, about um, panic attacks, all these different businesses and all these different niches. I have clients in them. So I get to see a more broad basis of what's working across all these different markets. And what's really interesting, it's those same basic principles that work across all the different markets. All that changes 
is the audience, which because the audience has different interests and desires, that just means we have a little bit different messaging for each of these different audiences, but the principles stay the same. That's very interesting. So do you want us to dig, to, to dig deeper into those different principles right now? I think that um, pe like the audience will massively benefit of what are actually the core principles that they have to focus on in order just to build a thriving online business. Let's do that. Let's, let's, let's dive into that specifically. And you can describe where you want to go with this. Because as I mentioned, there's the part where we build relationships, such as by email and we attract audiences. And then there's also the persuasion side and actually building out a message. And we could talk more about that. So which, which direction did you want to go with this? Something that would be very, very interesting is actually uh, something that you may not, not have mentioned directly right here. It's actually by start picking a market. That's a big aspect of going to the right business. And I'm going to say this, even as I start talking about choosing a market, a lot of people get so concerned and they get stuck at choosing a market because they're afraid they're going to make a mistake here. Mm -hmm. And I want to reassure people before I give even, even any direction here that it's okay to make a mistake in choosing a market because the market you start in today doesn't have to be the market that you end in. Mm -hmm. I have... Several different clients who are in more than one market, they do not try to start two markets at once. You can't do it. It's too much work. You're going to overwhelm yourself and confuse yourself. You can't do two markets at once. But I have several clients that are in multiple markets because they started a business. They made it successful in one market. Then they found another market they were actually more passionate about than the original one. And they built a new business up in the new market. And I mean, both of them are generating profits. They enjoyed both businesses. They just found something that they were a little more passionate about later. So the business you start in doesn't have to be the business that you end in as we start talking about choosing a market. And when I start telling people about choosing a market, I think one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make, and I kind of caution against this, is so many people want to choose internet marketing as their market. In other words, selling to other internet marketers. And I think it's because we do a disservice to people if we tell them that you need to um, go into a market that you're passionate about. And then people will say, well, you know, right now I'm passionate about online marketing. That's what I want to learn about. So that's what I want to teach. And it's a mistake to go into just what you're passionate about. Instead, what I tell people to find is to find the connection between several different factors. First of all, what are you passionate and curious about? Okay. The second aspect is what do you have experience in and skills in that you've actually helped others already? And then in addition, where do you have a story that you could tell? So you can see those second two parts are going to make someone really go back and look at what they've done in their life. It might be work experience. It might be hobbies that they have. For example, I mentioned learning Spanish is one of the markets that one of my clients is in. That's because he has a strong story there. He was actually teaching English in Mexico when he learned Spanish. And that creates, as you could imagine, a very story. I'm not going to go into his story, but that's a strong background story from because he was so embarrassed teaching these people English and he couldn't even speak Spanish very well. It was an embarrassing experience for him and it became a very strong story. So it's the same thing for you. Think back to the stories that you could tell that give you credibility and proof and along that you have experience that you can actually help clients. So it's passion, experience, and story to look back, where do I have an integration of all three of those? And sometimes I'll just tell clients, okay, let's sit down and let's brainstorm some different ideas. Go back, especially brainstorming about all the experience you have, work experience, hobby experience, other things you've been interested in that you've read multiple books on, for example, things that you've accomplished and overcame in your life. For example, I have another close friend who helps people with binge eating. And even though he's done a lot of other things in the business world, he's been in a lot of markets, Binge eating was something that really was a big factor to him because he struggled with it for years and he found a solution. And then that again came into a story that could go into that market. So find your experience, find your story and combine it with curiosity and passion. This is very interesting. And what would you say to, to people who, let's say, who have a lot of experiences um, in different fields? So they're very curious and, you know, they, um, you know, they amassed amount of knowledge in different fields. Um, the problem is that sometimes, you know, just making a choice and, and, and you know, uh, really tying, let's say, this specific expertise to a specific market, this is where, you know, sometimes people struggle with. 
I definitely understand because I said, I've, I've talked to clients. I've dealt with clients in that exact issue. They have a lot of experience in different markets. Um, This has happened a lot with clients I've dealt with who've had some type of business or managerial experience. Because again, there's a lot of applications and a lot of directions that could go in. And this would be true in other markets as well, but I just have a lot of experience with clients who have that in business or managerial type markets. You have to really set, and at this point in time, what I'll often do is start looking at the audience you can find online. Is it easy to find an audience in this market? In other words, if I start searching, can I find blogs that are serving this market? Can I find YouTube channels that are serving this market? Can I find Facebook groups that are serving this market? Am I going to be able to target an audience online and cost effectively get my message in front of them? And so that's the another aspect of this message is, hey, can I bring the people in? And so it almost becomes a little bit, okay, I have all the experience. I've done this, all the brainstorming. How do I choose? Okay, which ones can I actually go after? Which ones can I reach? And we're at the point now in online business that I do not look for empty markets. If there's a market that there are no competitors in, that scares me today. Now, in 1996, yeah, there was a lot of those markets. Today, if I see a market that has no competition whatsoever, I'm scared because I think everybody else who tried it probably failed. Um, Now, some people listening, you might be such geniuses that you come up with ideas that no one has ever come up with in the history of the world. But I don't see that for myself. I, I, any idea that I come up with, somebody has probably tried. My goal is to find a market that people are in the market and I can see that they're not doing a great job, yet they're still successful. Ooh, that's what I love. <laughs> if I can see a market where people are successful and they're doing a poor job, that's like you know golden to me because that means I know I can go in and I can do a better job. I can better serve this customer. And what do I mean by doing a poor job? That means that people aren't talking about the real problems in the market. They're not sharing a message that really resonates with the audience. And if you if you have a lot of experience in a market, if you have a lot of experience you know, talking to people on this topic, then you should recognize some of the things that people want to hear already that they need help with. And if I see people aren't doing that, if I see that people aren't building email lists well, if I see that they're just telling people, hey, join my newsletter instead of actually giving some type of free gift for joining the newsletter, hey, that's a good thing to me too. If they're, you know, writing posts and I don't see personality and stories and what they're sharing, they're just sharing tips and facts. Oh, I want that market because I know I can do better in that market. And so basically we're looking for a gap. We're looking for weaknesses in the market. So when we come to that point, it just means going in and doing a little bit of research and, and don't allow yourself to spend months doing this research. This type of research I'm talking about is a couple of days. Some of the best research you could ever do in a market is actually speak to some potential customers in the market, which you might already know a few that you can talk to. Um, Go online, see what kind of reviews people are doing on Amazon for books in the market. Join some Facebook groups on the topic, see what types of questions people are asking. And spend a couple of days, spend a week at most looking at a market. Yeah, so it's really... um you know, dipping your toes in, 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 into into perhaps the different ideas that you have and then just, you know, go for something that just seems like the low-hanging fruit, right? So poor marketing um, and, um, yeah, the, the, the kind of signals that you, that you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. Um, so after choosing the market, I know that you have like this um, a very interesting cheat sheet. I'm going to link to that in the show in the show notes that actually remembers people of the basics that they have to to look for. Can you walk us through those basics? Y- yes, I will. Okay, what you're referring to is what I call the Golden Glove, and you're referring to the Golden Glove cheat sheet. And as you said, you'll have a link to it so people can go go to it in the show notes and you can grab a free copy. And once you'll get at the page, you will have a chance to opt into my email list. And when you opt in, you'll get the full page cheat sheet as a good reminder for the principles, along with the questions that'll help you use the Golden Glove effectively. And I'll also send you a series of free videos that'll talk more about many of the main aspects of the Golden Glove. And here's what the Golden Glove is really about. It's about coming up with your persuasive message. And this applies to websites, it applies to emails, it applies to videos, it applies to any other type of persuasion that you're using. 
online. And it really works in person as well, but I developed for online marketing. And it really came as a growth because I went and spoke at a lot of different seminars and conferences in the past. And we did what we call hot seats at a lot of these events. And a hot seat was someone would say, hey, take a look at my email, take a look at my website, take a look at the offer that I'm making, and how can I improve it? And I needed to come up with a series of ways to help them improve their conversion quickly when I might only have them for like 15 minutes. And so that's what this is developed to do is to help you create a message or at least refine, improve your message within 15 minutes or less. And here are the, I call it the five fingers of the golden glove. And again, it's a golden glove because it has five fingers. You can just look at your hand to remember these points. And the five fingers of the golden glove are desperate problem, unique promise, overwhelming proof, an irresistible offer, and a reason to act now. All right. And we can go over each of these individually and they all build on each other. And you'll notice that it starts at desperate problem. That means who is the audience that I'm speaking to and what desperate problem or burning desire do they have that I can tap into? And everything else is built from that foundation. That makes a lot of sense because if, let's say, you have overwhelming proof or an, irre in an irresistible offer to a problem that nobody wants to get, get, get solved, then you'll, like, you, you could try as hard as you want, but you not be able to get any results. So I think that talking about a desperate problem deserves some time. So please, please, please go ahead. And you're right with this because it also they also build each other from this standpoint that whatever desperate problem that I'm solving, I'm going to make a unique promise that's specific to that problem. Then I'm going to use proof that backs up the promise. And the stronger your promise, the stronger the proof needs to be immediately after. So they all integrate with each other. When we talk about a desperate problem, and I like to call it desperate problem, because here's one of the classic mistakes that people make is they create an offer for something that's not a problem that people are willing to spend money to solve. I want problems that people have already proven to pull out their credit cards and pay for solutions to these problems. Let me give you an example in the health field, which, I mean, this is kind of a classic example to a problem. And that is, it's next to impossible to sell prevention. Okay, so you notice that there's all types of things that we know that we can do to help us to prevent future heart disease. Okay, but that's a hard sale. That is a really, really hard sale to prevent future heart disease. But once somebody starts having pains in their heart, okay, once start, somebody has a heart attack, it's easy to sell a solution at this point in time. Once somebody started having the pain, the solution is easy to sell. So that's what we got to think about is we need a desperate problem. That means somebody's already feeling the pain for whatever this is. And, you know, it varies on the different market. It depends on what you're selling. Um, I'll go over to the Spanish since I already mentioned about that. So a client teaching Spanish, right? Well, Spanish, you know, is learning Spanish really a desperate problem? It is or it isn't, but it's, there's a little burning desire to it. Now, who's more likely to buy something on learning Spanish? Somebody who is just a little bit interested in learning Spanish or somebody who scheduled a vacation to Mexico a month from now. All right. I think that's pretty obvious which one's more likely to be interested in the Spanish course. The person who's going to have it happen very soon. So it's a problem. It's something they're thinking about right now. It's on their mind right now. And whatever it is that you're teaching, you need to tap into what struggle somebody has. And I could mention it in that market again, not only do they struggle, hey, they're going to be having this vacation soon, going to Mexico. Perhaps they're even living in Mexico already. And now that that's a really a desperate problem to learn Spanish. But, or it could be just the fact that they've tried many times before and they weren't able to speak Spanish. So there's a desperate problem here that they want to solve. And I mean, we can go over to other markets. For example, in business to business, the easiest thing to sell in most cases in business to business is attract more clients, attract more customers and clients, because somebody who's in business, that's a serious pain point if they're not attracting enough customers and clients. They don't have money coming in. Um, another pain point that sells well in the business market is to help people automate and optimize their business because we're so overwhelmed 
So we actually can tap into that problem. So look at whatever the problem is in your market. What are the desperate problems that they're willing to solve? Where are the big pain points or the big desires? Like I'll jump over to tennis for a second. In tennis, you know, does anybody really have a desperate problem to learn tennis? <laughs> Not really, but it is a burning desire. It becomes a desperate problem if they want to play tennis and every time they serve, they end up hitting the net. And I mentioned that because over in tennis, serve is extremely important because that's like the burning desire in the market. And if you're going to go in the tennis market, you need to help people improve their serve because that's what you're standing there. And that's where people get embarrassed if they're serving into the net. So see how I just brought up a pain point? There's an embarrassment. There's a point of status. And see, I'm getting a little more advanced on principles. There's a point of status if you can serve really, really well in the tennis market because because now you're getting an ace on your opponents. You're scoring a point without them being able, able to return the serve. So that's a status point as well. Get rid of the embarrassment, move into status. So no matter what market you're in, you can need to look at what the pain points are, what are the desperate problems, and how can I really help my audience and really go descriptive of this problem. And the best way to really dive into the problem, really talk about the problem, is your own story or the stories of clients that you've helped. Because I don't like writing any copy that says, you feel X, Y, Z. The reason being is if I write something on my website or an email says that here's how you feel, if I'm off by even a little bit, people are going to say, no, that's not exactly how I feel. And so I just lost the customer because I didn't get it perfect. But if I tell them I had this problem and here's how I felt, it's not the same. They'll now, if they identify with anything, so I, all I have to do is get kind of close, right? So it's I have to get kind of close if I'm telling you my story and then they'll identify with it. But I have to tell them how they feel. So I, I avoid, don't tell people how they feel, tell them how you felt that they'll identify with. Or tell them how a client felt that they'll identify with. So that's how you share a problem and you make a connection, whether it's a website, a video, or an email. Awesome. That makes perfect sense. So thank you very much for this little insight where um, that you just mentioned when it comes to, you know, um, talking more about about like you from your perspective. So in case you don't get it 100% right, like <laughs> you, you'll, you'll still be able to, to make the sale. So everything starts with, with, with a... With a, with a desperate problem, not just a problem, a really desperate problem. So I think you you hit the nail on, on its head with um, you know all all the examples right here. Um, so then I think we we are going to dig deeper into um, really like the unique promise. And um, before letting you you know talk about the unique promise right here, I learned this back from Eugene Schwartz in in, in Breakthrough Advertising when he, when he talked about a product can have multiple benefits, but you really have to pick one and i think a lot of people struggle when it comes to just making a choice okay so what angle am i going to use to actually promote um, my product so please go ahead your first help with coming up with your unique promise is looking at the desperate problem because if you defined your desperate problem well then you know that the promise you need to make because whatever the problem is that you're whatever the problem is, the promise needs to meet that problem. It needs to solve that problem for your audience. So that's your first clue. The second thing I like to look at is what is my competitive advantage in the marketplace when I talk about this promise? And um, I've already mentioned another little phrase here. There's what we call price of entry benefits and point of difference benefits, okay? If I was in the weight loss market, a price of entry benefit is that my weight loss system has to help actually help you lose weight. And um, not only does my weight loss system have to help you lose weight, but to do well in the weight loss market, a price of entry benefit is that it has to have some level of weight loss pretty quickly or people are going to give up. All right. So I've got to help you lose weight. I've got to help you do it pretty quickly. It needs to be in most cases as a price of entry benefit, it needs to be something that isn't difficult or complicated to use either. So those are all price of entry benefits. They're not a good point of difference. They're not a good unique promise to focus on. So if somebody else's weight loss, you know, your point of difference might be um, exactly how your system works or how it's put together. Let me jump over to a little bit different example because it's one that you know I have personally from one of my own offers. I have a course that teaches people how to get started or improve 
their coaching and consulting business. I call it uh, magnetic mentoring is the name of the course. And in that market, obviously the big problem that people want to solve is they want to attract clients, obviously. And now that course, it can teach people how to improve the results that they get for clients. It can teach people how to attract new clients. But I really focused on a unique promise, a point of difference based off of my own story, based on my own experience. I've been consulting clients one-on-one since 2006. I started online in 1996. I actually took one-on-one clients in 2006. And since then, one of the things that's like unique about my coaching program is that I rarely ever do any type of free calls. I have a coaching program that people on my email list, they sign up for a waiting list. And then when I have spaces that open up that are available in coaching, people buy it. They they get a link over to where they can pay. Here's my coaching program. You pay and then we'll start coaching. Period. No free, you know, no free call. No, you know, let's me try to sell you no webinars trying to sell people on it. It's just a very simple system selling it. So I focus pretty heavily in that course on building automated systems that pre-sell your customers and clients for you. So that was my focus on the unique promise. So there were several different directions I could have taken for my unique promise, but I took that one because that stood out from the competition and it also integrated into my own story. So when we're talking about unique promise, you have to solve the problem, which for coaching, it was to attract new clients, but there's a lot of ways you can attract clients. And then my uniqueness, the promise came how I've actually done it since 2006 and how that much different it is than how most other people attract clients. And I'm curious, how did you actually find out that the way that you want to sell your programs should be without those discovery calls? Like, was it because you didn't enjoy them or was it because you just saw everything, everyone doing this in your market and you just wanted to do the opposite of what the majority was doing? Like, what was your your thought process behind that. My own personal story is we go back um, early on and most of the clients I originally attracted was, you know, straight through the sales process. And it was almost an experiment because everyone else said, hey, you have to do webinars, you have to do calls, you have to get on the phone with client and do all these free calls. And I have done free calls. I know how to close by them. I've written webinar scripts for other people as well. And I've run my own webinars and I've closed from webinars. But I don't really like doing webinars and I don't like doing free calls. So I was basically just a challenge to myself. Hey, I've sold all these other things by email. Can I sell coaching and mentoring by email alone too? Well, guess what? I sure can. And that's what I enjoy doing. I prefer writing an email. And I consider that much more fun than doing the free calls types of things. And like, for example, also with my coaching program, I've had clients now for years and years. I mean, I have clients who've been with me 10, 11, and up on years. And you really get to know those clients. Those are easy to deal with compared to doing like free calls where you have to get to know somebody for the very first time on that call. So more than anything, it was almost a challenge to myself of whether I could sell this too by email. And guess what? I could. And then I found with some of my clients over those years, we've set up similar systems for a couple of them as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Love it. Love it. Um, then let's move on to the third uh, to the third component right here, which is overwhelming proof. Overwhelming proof. You need, and as soon as you make a strong promise, you need to have proof that immediately backs it up. And the stronger the promise is, the stronger the proof needs to be. And I found a lot of success, and this is part of me experimenting and doing those hot seats, is the easiest way to improve many people's website conversion is to simply look for the best proof they have of their site and move it to the top of the page. I just gave everybody the ease. If you're a copywriter, I just showed you how to become a genius to some of your clients. Find the strong proof they put on the testimonials page, which is the dumbest place in the world to put it, and put it right under your headline. Boom, you just improve the response in most many cases. So that's like one of the easiest things to do is move proof earlier. I'm thinking right now of one client who had a sales video and his sales video had a bunch of really good before and after testimonials about 16, 17 minutes in. And the first thing I, one of the first things I told him to do is, hey, let's just grab those and let's stick those at two minutes in. In other words, bring up the problem, 
make your promise, then we're going to immediately throw in the testimonials for proof to your promise. That immediately bumped us his response. Here's another example. A client was testing. We were doing a lot of split tests on his opt-in pages. Um, I gave him several headlines. I wrote headlines for his page. We tested those. We tested a lot of different things on his opt-in page. We tested the offer, which of course you should do a headline offer. That's what everybody tells you to test. The test that was the most effective that had the biggest change was actually testing testimonials. So he had a opt-in page. We have a headline. We have an opt-in button. And we had a testimonial right underneath it. Changing that testimonial right there and testing it might actually be the other way around. We might actually have a headline testimonial and then button right after it. Now, it's one of those two and I, you could test both, but testing that testimonial was the most effective, biggest conversion enhancement that we did on that page was getting the right testimonial and the right testimonial had the person's photo. The photo matched the ideal client avatar, the actual best buyer perfectly. His response was a solution to the problem that they had in the testimonial. And it was a short version of their testimonial right there. That was the most effective test. And that has led me to do the same thing for other clients, bringing that testimonial up. I love now putting a testimonial right under a headline. I love, you know, putting testimonials on the opt-in pages. I love doing a lot of different things for proof. And testimonials are just one form of proof. You have your own story. You have facts and stats that you can find about it. If you're in the health field, for example, if you find something that Harvard Medical School said, hey, that's a proof point to put in. There's a lot of different ways you can do proof. And it's a big deal for making the sell. So think of those three together, problem, promise, and proof. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's um, really backing up your, your promise with um, and, and showing people that it actually works. And, you know, we can certainly refer people back also to um, Robert Sardini's um, persuasion right where social proof like right? <laughs> why social proof is is so important so uh, sometimes you know you don't really need to have you know uh to like to go too fancy in your marketing i mean if you just have let's say what you just mentioned with the overwhelming proof and with the two other elements like you you're pretty good to go like you can actually build a, a whole a whole you know sales page with what you just mentioned so number four is the irresistible offer the irresistible offer. And that simply means how can we make an offer that's irresistible to the customers? And there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. I'm going to mention one right here because I think it's a really good example. And that is one of the irresistible offers that I've like went back to as a go-to one is the trial offer. And here's how it works. I'm thinking right now of a client who sells a course. And what he does in this course is he actually sells it for $199, but we broke it up. And what that means is when you first go to his page, it costs you $1 to try out the course for seven days. In seven days, you're going to be billed $99. 30 days later, you're going to build, build another $99. So he's charging $199. But we're doing it with an irresistible offer because, hey, you can actually try out the course for one buck. That's it. One buck. Um, that's an easy decision. If somebody actually has the desperate problem that we'll go back to, well, I can try out to see if the solution is actually going to work with me for me for a dollar. Well, yeah, I'm going to do it. And it's amazing how good an irresistible offer like that works. And of course, that's just one example of what an irresistible offer can look like. An irresistible offer could mean that you add in a whole bunch of bonuses that are worth more than the price of the product itself. Yeah, they could mean that you add some other type of bonus give. It could be that this is a huge discount that you're offering that isn't what people would expect for this price point. Perhaps you have higher volume for a specific product. We'd be thinking about an e-commerce type product here. So you're able to offer the product at 50% off for this. Or like, here's another example with e-commerce products that I used in the past. And that was a scratch and dent sale where we had you know, returns, but the products is still in good condition and selling it for a big discount price. It's kind of amazing. I remember back, we had one client who was selling some physical courses. So these were actual physical courses that had CDs and things like that, that we sold in the past. And he did a scratch and dent sale for any of the returns that he had come in. And it was so successful. So many people wanted to buy during the scratch and dent sale. He was really tempted to go in and start ripping open his other packages to sell those too, because he sold out of the... Um, you know, scratch and dent so much just because that was such an irresistible offer. So always think about, okay, how can I make this offer even more irresistible and 
bigger benefit for my customers to produce better results for them. Your guarantee could come in this, having a really incredible guarantee. As well. There's a lot of different pieces to having a really good irresistible offer. And then I might as well mention and bring it in at the same time. And that's the fifth finger is the reason to act now, because that usually integrates in with the offer. You need some type of reason for people to act now. And I even joke about it all the time. It's like a joke between me and my clients. And it's what I call the heart attack curve. Okay, here's how the, what I call the heart attack curve. We run a special to our email list. And let's say that we run this special for five days. So we send out our email. We send out an email every day. And usually we send several emails on the last day of the special. But so we send an email to our list for this special. There's some, it's a discount or it's an extra bonus. A lot of times it's some type of discount. And let's say that on Monday we send a special and we say, hey, it ends at Friday at midnight Pacific time. And on Monday we get some orders usually from the people who are first in line and buy everything that we sell, because you always end up with a few of those on your list. And those are the people that you really love. You know them by name, those types of customers. They buy on the first day. The second day, you get a little trickle of orders. The third day, you get a little trickle of orders. By the third day, you're usually saying, you know, this offer is really messed up. I missed it this time. You know, this offer is not generating the sales I thought it would. There's been many times in the past, I joke about it now, and I joke about it with my clients all the time. There's been many times in the past that I've said to my wife on day three or even day four of a five-day special, I've told her, you know, I really missed it this time. Something about this offer, people aren't responding to. They're not buying this time. And then you hit the fifth day, especially the last 12 hours of the fifth day, and things go crazy. There's been many times I see more more than 50%, sometimes more than 60% of all the sales for the whole special in the last 12 hours of the special. And I call it the heart attack curve because you've been thinking this whole time how much you failed until that last day. So I kind of refuse. So I, all clients will always come back to me, you know, this this special isn't working very well. And I'm like, I'm not even paying attention to your numbers until, until the last day. <laughs> I don't even, I, I'm not even looking at them till the last day. Because that's how much I reason to act now, how important and how powerful it is. And you might say, well, I'm not running a special. This is something that needs to be evergreen. It needs to be up all the time. If you really want to convert well with something that needs to be up all the time, I would still figure out, okay, what can I do that's special? And I want it to be real. I don't want like the fake specials. You see people put up like timers on their website that, you know, they hit zero and then they reset or the timer counts down to zero and it's resets brand new tomorrow. No, that's lying to your customers. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real sales that they end on Friday. That doesn't mean you're never going to run the sale again. You might run the same sale again three months from now, six months from now, but it's still a sale. It ends when you say it's going to end. Um, you can still do something evergreen like that. And I have a lot of clients. Here's what they do. As soon as somebody joins their email list, it triggers a code in the systems. There's some tools out there such as Deadline Funnel or Thrive Ultimatum and other tools like that that can do this, that will trigger as soon as somebody joins the list. And they can now offer a new subscriber special that whether somebody comes from that device or they come from a different device, doesn't matter what, you know, they're on their mobile phone and then they go on a computer, the way that it's triggered in the system and the way that the emails email out to the person, it's going to code it so the special can end seven days from now, for example, or 14 days from now, whatever we're setting for the end of the special. And we could run a real deadline special that's evergreen for every new subscriber as a new subscriber special when you join the list. And so it's still a very real special with a strong deadline that can improve your sales. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, um, it, like sometimes I'm also like smashing my head, let's say when I, when I'm just doing a launch, like you're, you could, you know, work on so many things at the same time, but at the end, like, it's just this freaking urgency that, that, that makes people buy. So if you're just running offers and not having urgency, obviously, as you mentioned, we're talking here about real urgency because, you know, using fake urgency will, you know, it will hurt your, 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 let's say your, your relationship with the audience. And like, this is certainly not something that you want to do. But again, like those simple things are just too simple. And, and what really blows my mind, Terry, is that people see the simple stuff and then they, they tell themselves, okay, I know that, or okay, that makes sense. Cool. Show me the show me the fancy stuff. So what is your what is your answer to to you know to those kind of people? Because like I was one of them for many, many years. My answer to that is the fancy stuff is simply a build on of the simple, basic foundational stuff in specific examples. 
Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'll see what I mean by that. A few minutes ago, when talking about overwhelming proof, I told you that we split tested the testimonials on the opt-in page. Have you heard anybody else talk about that? That's advanced. I would call that advanced stuff that's based, that's built on the simple foundation because I knew we needed more proof. So we tested that. And even testing the photo of the testimonial was extremely important. People want these things that have nothing to do with the foundation material. And they're, they're going off basis. The real advanced stuff is testing these principles to see what works today. See, I'll, I'm going to throw you another free one here. Okay, I just gave you two things that you put together to make it more advanced. And that is, I talked about some type of evergreen special and the fact that you need to have a reason out now. You need to have scarcity. You know, Maybe you don't want to discount your product. Well, why don't you take what I said about a resistible offer, and I've had clients do this many times. In fact, I had a client do this on a Black Friday sale, and it was super effective. He took the same price for his membership that it always is. So it's $29.95 a month for his membership. He didn't want to discount it. So all we did for his Black Friday special was we said, you can try it out for the first 30 days for $1. And it was super effective. All we did was take that, put it here, (laughs) over here, and now it works. And that's what advanced things really are. It's taking what works somewhere, trying it over here. Let's make a little variation to it. Let's try something a little bit different. Hey, let's write our guarantee differently this time. Let's do something different and see how it works with our audience. And it always comes back to the audience. And it really always comes back to the Golden Glove too, which is why I talk about the Golden Glove a lot. It comes back to those five principles. And you just build, think, think of it this way. No engineer, there's no engineer out there that's going to build a big, beautiful building without putting in a good foundation first. If somebody tries to build that big, gorgeous, brand new building that could be, you know, architects can create these incredible designs that are beautiful, but if they do not have a good foundation, <laughs> then it's a joke. It's going to fall. What I like about, um, at least what I see from from your from your business and how you're doing things is like, you're keeping things simple. And one of the temptations when you have like such a lightweight and and simple business is to constantly, you know, try to pick or to add more things to your plate. So since, you know, uh, so at at least, so this is something that, that, that I, that I see in my own business is let's say you just work hard on creating system, creating things that make your life easier. And then you just see, okay, I don't like, I can take more on or I can do something, you know, I can add more things to my plate. And then at the end, you again, like end up with too many things to do and then you have to, to, you have to re-simplify things again. So um, what's your take on that? True, as I think that comes from, again, um, wisdom in many com- times comes from experience. Okay. And I'll say this for teaching, if somebody really understands a topic well, it becomes simple when they teach it. Okay, because they know what they're talking about. They're not trying to overcomplicate it because they really understand the different aspects. I've helped so many clients over the years who've gotten to the place where we had to simplify their business because they overwhelmed themselves. And so, you know, it goes back to, I'm sure everybody's heard of the 80-20 rule. So what's 20% is producing 80% of the results. Let's focus more on that. Let's do a really good job here. And it comes back to, I started, see, we're almost making all the way back around to the beginning. Remember where I said we started with, which was, you know, we need to have our audience. We need a way to tap into our audience. We need to get them onto a list. We need to communicate regularly with them. We need to have offers that we're making. We need to be able to have persuasion. And so how you do each of those, there's a little bit of what works for you and what you enjoy doing. Because for me, you know, all of my clients use email to some level. I have some clients who they do use webinars. You know, I don't use webinars very often because I don't really like doing them. But I have clients who use webinars regularly. So webinars are part of their system. What you don't want to do is see Joe over here that's doing really well with one topic and then integrate that in your business. Okay. Then you see somebody else over here doing this and say, oh, wow, they're doing really good with this. I'm going to integrate that into my business too. Soon you're going to have a confusing mess is what you're going to have. Or you're going to look at a guru who has 40 employees and you're going to say, well, I see that he's doing this, this, and that. I need to do all these in my business too to be successful. They weren't doing that when they were by themselves. That's what they built over the last 10 years as their company grew. You need to think about what are the simple basics, which is I need an audience. I need a way to communicate with them regularly. I need good offers to help them achieve results. And I need to be able to do persuasion. I need to really focus on these basics, integrate in. Like even talking about traffic generation and list building, there's so many different ways you can do it. You need to choose a model 
that fits your personality and your audience. That's good, that you're going to be consistent with. What can you do consistently? And at least to some point, I mean, work can often be, you know, a little bit difficult. Sometimes work, you know, might not always enjoy it, but you should at least have some fun with whatever traffic generation technique. You should at least enjoy it to a point. Don't force yourself to do something that you hate all the time. If it's something you hate, then that's something you're going to learn to outsource very quickly. So simplify your business. Look for the best way to serve your clients consistently. And you know what really fits your business? Because again, working with so many clients, there's so many different applications of these principles that I taught. I just taught people the basics of the Golden Globe. I have the cheat sheet that they can go over and grab on my website and then several more videos that go. I think the videos go more into the problem, promise, and proof, especially what the three videos talk about a lot that there. These are like the basics, but over the years, you should see so many different ways I can apply the same golden glove. And that's one of the reasons I teach this. It's simple to learn. It'll take you years to master it and see all the different applications of it. Yeah, that makes that makes so much sense. So it's really dedicating yourself to really understanding the principles and then applying them. And if there is something that's not working in what you're currently doing, just like look at your hand, look at your hand and you'll see the gold, the golden glove in front of you. And I would encourage everyone to simply grab uh, the cheat sheet and really watch the videos, read your emails because um, they are easy to understand and they simply go straight to the things that you need to master. So you really don't need to overwhelm yourself. And uh, yeah, next time you, you know, you struggle with anything, look at your hand, look at the golden glove and the answer is there. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add um, when it comes to where people obviously can join your list? We're going to link to the, to the links in their show notes, but anything else that, that you want to add before we wrap up this call? No, I don't think, I, I think they just need to go up and grab their freebies, get on the list. I, I think they'll learn a lot just watching how I communicate with my list as well. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you. All right. So I hope that you've enjoyed this episode with Mr. Terry Dean. I'm going to leave all the links to Terry's work in the show notes. And if you want to speed up your content creation workflow to create better content faster so that you can attract more clients online, be also sure to check out the link to my daily emails. Thank you very much for tuning in today. And I see you next week with another awesome episode.